These are some thoughts on Portrait Artist of the Year and the recapping that I've done for two seasons now. This is a long video and I hope that you find it entertaining. Let's get started. First, a quote by Edgar Degas, who was known for painting ballerinas for the most part. There are a lot of great, great quotes from him, but this one in particular came to mind. The more complex something becomes, the less joy that you can sort of bring to the endeavor. Now let's start the video. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. I've been recapping seasons three and four of Portrait Artist of the Year. And so far it's been a really great series. But I want to talk about some reflections I have after recapping two seasons, and I am going to go on to recap season five. What I realized is I love the Great British Baking Show. Maybe you're familiar with it. Amateur bakers, I think it's about 13 of them, same kind of ideas. This program is one person is voted off the island, so to speak, once a week, and there's one winner at the very end. The diff and, and I find that program incredibly joyful. And this, whereas the painter, uh, Portrait Artist of the Year, is not joyful for me. It has moments of joy that spark joy, but it's not joyful. So I thought, okay, why is the Great British Baking Program joyful? Well, it's joyful because they're all amateurs. Nobody's a professional. They're showing up because they really care about baking. They all have a commitment and an interest in baking and doing the best they can. So there's a camaraderie. And also, there is no prize at the end. The prize at the end is a glass platter. You could buy it at home get goods for $10. It just happens to be engraved. So that makes all the difference in the world. Now, what happens in this program, the Portrait Artist of the Year, is that uh, the winner does win a prize. It's a $10,000 commission. But if they're going and doing this for the money, it's a complete waste of time. And I don't think they're doing it for the money. Of course, what they want to do is advance their art career and get their name out there. But if they were doing it for money, by the time you get to, if you're the final contestant, you've done six paintings, six paintings. Just think of how many hours that is for basically your $10,000. So they're not doing it for the money, but the money does, factor into into that this is a mixture of amateurs and professionals. All right, so let's hold on to that for a minute. Now, one of the things that I think all artists, I know people do in general, but artists in particular are very judgmental about their own work. And I find it particularly lovely to find someone with extremely high self-esteem who thinks whatever they do is great because that is the place to come to when you're painting. Everything's great. And the bottom line is, it's just a painting. If it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to, the first thing I do, I have a rip fest. I enjoy a rip fest. Rip it up, it's gone, and it completely goes away from my memory as well. Now, that is also because I've been a professional artist, and now I don't know that I'm a professional anymore because I don't try to sell anything anymore. I'm not interested in selling anything anymore. I'm interested in entertaining myself. So I get to choose when I want to paint, what I want to paint, and under what conditions. And that is the most joyful place to be because you put on your music and you, all the decisions are for you to make. If things don't turn out well, it doesn't matter. And I like to compare it very much to cooking. You know, when we cook a meal or we cook brownies, for example, nobody who bakes brownies for themselves, who might burn them, walks around for two days afterwards and says, I burned the brownies. I'm no good. I should never bake again. <laughs> they don't. They say, darn it. I burned the brownies. Maybe I'll make another batch or maybe I'll scratch off the burnt parts. It's with that kind of spirit that I want to come to painting. So. I know I'm always using cooking and baking and food analogies, but it kind of shows up. And there's something about the arts when it comes to competition where that joy and openness about what you create gets squashed or compressed because it is a competition. So for me, as I go forward into recapping Portrait Artist of the Year, I'm going to change the title uh, in my head because I thought, what would make it feel okay to you, Joe? And I thought, it would make me feel a lot better if it was called a Portrait Artist of the Year, not the Portrait Artist of the Year, because the kind of 
means the best. And they're not necessarily the best. They happen to be a portrait painter, as they all are from the very, very beginning. So from the very beginning, if you enter this program, you've already won. Yay, good on you. You are a portrait painter. And that is I, what I want the takeaway to be of the program. One of the things that happens in the program, as you know, if you've been watching, is that they, after four hours of looking at a model and painting, they turn their easels around. And that's when the, you know, the judgments start to happen. The joy, the absolute joy when they turn those easels around, that's why I watch the program. It's so enjoyable. I love, love, love that moment. And then it turns into, you know, what we know the program is. It has a mission. The mission is to judge these artists. And we know the comparison kills joy. And so the minute you start judging, the joy factor starts to go down. Um, I do think this could be solved, as I said before, I think I've said before, if we had rotating judges and they were artists and they had spent some time on canvas, that would make a difference. And remember, in the great British baking show, the judges are known for their baking skills and they've published and been TV presenters. And that's kind of important, I think, when it comes to the tone of this program. The other thing is, and the judges always say this, they're looking for something new, they're looking for something different. So I finally have gotten the message in my own head. They're not looking for the best representational painter. They're not even interested in the best representational painter. They want contemporary work that is not academic. And I think my problem with watching the program has been, in my head, I'm thinking, well, don't you want the best painter in the room, the person who captured the likeness of the person? Isn't that the goal? And something I realized kind of recently is, no, they don't. They don't. What they really want is an interpretation of what the artist sees. And we all know that art is not about reproducing necessarily what you see, but what you either want to see or what you want to convey. And in the last finals, which was season four, episode nine, I did episode nine and 10 together, surely one of the best representational painter did not win. And I thought he really should have won. And then I thought, Maybe not. Maybe not because he painted exactly what was in front of him. There was, you could argue, there was nothing of him in the painting. Whereas the person that won was, was very interpretive. Now, the way to think of this as an analogy for me, not a baking analogy for a change, is when it comes to classical music and jazz music. Classical music is usually judged by how well you, you play the notes, right? When you're a really great classical musician, you know, if you were to watch Horowitz, for example, you know, the way he presses a key with a certain emphasis and finesse. I mean, we're talking high level ability to play and interpret music. That's that wonderful synergy that can happen between an artist who knows their field very, very well and then can make artistic choices based on their knowledge and quite frankly, years and years and years of work. So, but a jazz uh, uh, pianist, for example, needs to have the same structures and understanding of the musical instrument, but there is more emphasis on being interpretive and being collaborative and maybe not playing note for note, but playing kind of what you feel or what you feel you are moved to do. It's almost like a conversation as composed, uh, as compared to say, um, what I think of as classic uh, piano, which would be more like a lecture. You know, here, play the notes. 
<laughs> I may be I may be way off on this because I, you know music is not my field. But but I have a brother who is uh, he's an amateur pianist, but he's really not. He is he is as professional as anybody I've ever heard. And so we do talk about these concepts a lot. Why is it as we get more and more proficient at doing these skills? And for me, it's painting. For him, it's it's the piano. Why does it become somehow? I hate to use the word painful, but you know, painful. Why are we not happy about our efforts? Why are we constantly disquieted by our work? And we do find comfort in it's good to be disquieted because then you're going to work harder or in a different way. I mean, there's a motivation to, to that feeling, but it's also soul crushing. And what I'm going to try to do with both my recaps and with my painting is really enjoy the whole process. So when I sit down to paint, enjoy it. Enjoy what it feels like to put your brush in some juicy paint. What does it feel like when you put it on the canvas? I mean, it can almost be a really sensory experience. And when you're deeply, deeply, deeply in the process, you're not even aware that the world is happening around you. I could have an alarm go off and I wouldn't know. And that is, such a great place to get to. Oftentimes when I sit down to paint, I'm painting because I want to get to that place of Zen, not because I even want to paint, but I don't know any other way of getting there <laughs> because I don't use drugs. <laughs> so those are some thoughts. I still really love the program, the core of the program I really love because I think it demystifies why what artists do and we've all been out in public let's say plain air painting and someone will say well you know my kid could do that or the other real famous one is you hear this a lot when artists are interviewed one of the first questions that the interviewer will ask is how long did it take you to do the painting is that the most unimportant question to you as an artist how long did it take no, who cares <laughs> it has nothing to do with it the painting the piece that's the point. However you get to that piece of work, whatever that process is, that's what matters. And that's what the interviewer should be asking. How do you get to this? How do you work through the process? How do you get to this place? And I do think that this program does a good job of that because it shows you how an artist begins to see the form, how they begin to put those marks on the canvas, how they begin to connect shapes, how they will do an under underpainting, etc. And so it does demystify that you just sit down and you know do three strokes and you're done. So those are some thoughts on Portrait Artist of the Year and recapping and finding the joy in all painting, not just our painting, but in paintings that we see of other people. And if you've watched this, I'm sorry to, to uh, bless you, thank you for watching this long. No one's watched this long, I already know that. But <laughs> give me a thumbs up. It turns out YouTube thumbs up are real important. Subscribers are real important. Um, but more important than that, in, enjoy your art. If you would enjoy your, your art and not judge it and be, give yourself so much grace for the fact that you're doing it at all and get back to that. I think that is the most important part of any of these endeavors and staying curious about what it is we do. Uh, so remember to keep the white to your paper white, your paint's wet, mask for value, mix for color, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.